small chromosomal rearrangements at birth uh, uh, in, in, the, in the human population that, are, that go completely undetected. So, okay. Okay, so <clears throat> in thinking about sort of how genes and genomes evolve, uh, it's important to uh, kind of contemplate how do we end up with so many genes that do so many interesting things. And so um, this, kind of, this concept of gene duplication uh, is, uh, is part of the uh, sort of uh, the thinking about how evolution works. Uh, and it's sort of demonstrated in this slide. So here you start out with a, a piece of DNA that has a gene here and some abnormal genetic event caused the duplication of that segment and produced two completely functional genes that, that the breakpoints happen here. So nothing bad happened to the gene. They're both expressed. And now these two genes are passed along in the population over time. And so because there are two genes that carry out exactly the same function, it means that mutations occurring in one of the genes, even if they change the function of the gene would have no lasting effect on the organism because it's still got perfectly normal function in the other copy. And so this, this mechanism, this sort of duplication and then uh, uh, mutation model of gene evolution is how uh, many people believe that uh, uh, human and other organisms' genes have evolved to the complex state that they're at, which is to say that new functions can evolve by the process of new genes uh, forming these duplications, and then these new mutations are occurring. So it's important then, if you think about doing genetics in people, to know that there are these genes that are duplicated. So uh, for example, a classic case of a gene duplicated set of genes are the hemoglobin genes in humans. And there are actually four different hemoglobin genes that are produced in humans, but two of them are, one of them is an adult form, and the other is a fetal form. They have somewhat different function uh, and uh, their differences in function have to do with their ability to bind oxygen. Okay, and so it turns out that fetal hemoglobin binds oxygen much better than adult hemoglobin does. And so uh, adults don't need that, so fetal hemoglobin turns off in adults. But there's a human disease called sickle cell disease in which um, the adult form is mutated and uh, it's, it's in serious, uh, and when it's mutated, it causes serious disease in individuals who have that. However, uh, there's currently now a gene therapy uh, that's uh, in clinical trials in which people who have a mutated adult hemoglobin, because of there's, there's this duplication event, uh, people who have this, uh, this mutated adult form are treated with um, uh, a gene uh, activating agent where they modify the fetal gene so that it becomes expressed. And so when the fetal gene is now expressed in the adult, it compensates for the mutant adult form, and uh, you end up with a person who's cured of sickle cell disease. And it turns out that this is uh, probably going to be the most popular uh, form of treatment for uh, sickle cell disease in the next 10 years. Um, it's right now in uh, phase three clinical trials where people are being, uh, where people use uh, a mechanism called CRISPR-Cas to change the expression of the fetal gene in people with, with sickle cell disease. Uh, and so they can be repaired. And it's all due, it's all possible because these genes are duplicated in the, uh, have duplicated in the human genome back in the evolutionary past. Uh, another example of uh, mutated, uh, of genes that are duplicated are the rhodopsins, which uh, are involved in color perception in your eye. And um, these genes, um, uh, when mutated, uh, limit the ability to see colors. And so, uh, some significant, and since these genes are located on the uh, X chromosome, there's a significant fraction of uh, particularly men in the population who are colorblind because they've lost uh, one or more of the, the rhodopsin uh, producing genes uh, in their genome due to mutation. Okay, so uh, then, uh, so as we've sort of gone over this now and I'll just refresh, I'll just say it again. Uh, uh, when Mendel thought about genetics and uh, uh, genes and uh, recovery of genes, uh, he uh, proposed this kind of idea of this law of independent assortment where alleles in the uh, adult uh, segregate, come apart in the uh, production of gametes by the process of meiosis so that they could form uh, all possible combinations of alleles. So this gamete has 
to, to uh, wild type alleles. This one has one wild type and one uh, non wild type and so forth. And so uh, you can, you know, so every individual then is able to produce tremendous amount of variety of offspring. Okay. All right. And so <clears throat> uh, the, the, um, the other thing I wanted to just uh, emphasize when thinking about genetics and uh, how genetics can influence gene expression is the concept of dominance. Uh, and so uh, in, in this sort of notion of dominance, which was worked out by, again, by Gregor Mendel in the late 1800s, before he knew anything about genes or knew anything about uh, DNA or gene expression or anything like that, just by observing, uh, he proposed uh, this concept that uh, genes can exist in two forms. One is called a dominant form and one is the recessive form. And if you get both, uh, uh, if you inherit both dominant forms from your parent, you have a particular phenotype. In this case, it was round peas. Uh, if you got one dominant and one recessive, the dominant form would, would override the expression, if you will, of the mutant form. And you'd still end up with a normal looking round uh, uh, pea. But if you inherited the mutant form or the recessive form uh, only, and that's possible because, you, because of random assortment, you could get uh, uh, any of them from your parent, uh, you'd end up with the mutant phenotype. So this idea of dominance uh, at the molecular level uh, is an important concept because it means that if you're thinking about genetic studies in people, the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the inheritance of uh, the dominant or recessive form is very important in whether or not you have a disease or whether or not your crop is producing the right protein. Um, so it's important to uh, keep that concept in mind. However, uh, it turns out that it's obviously, it's not that simple, right? And so uh, the, the process of producing these wrinkled peas or these round peas uh, is the result of the production of, uh, of the R and the little r gene, but it's also uh, the product of uh, interactions with many other genes. So every single phenotype that is observed is actually not just a single gene, but it's the result of interactions of many genes. And so dominance doesn't always hold. And so this big R, little r uh, individual might not have a round P, it might have a partly wrinkled P, it might have intermediate phenotypes. And so uh, dominance is not absolute. Uh, and, uh, and moreover, it's not predictable. So unless you can study the actual gene that you're interested in specifically, it's often difficult to sort out uh, the dominance and recessive um, relationships. Okay. So, uh, so I'm thinking about then uh, inheritance of dominant traits and recessive traits. Um, one dominant trait in, uh, in uh, humans is, uh, is a, a disease called Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a, an example of a, a, a highly penetrant dominant trait, which is to say that if you inherit the mutant allele for Huntington's disease, you will get Huntington's disease no matter what the other allele is, is that's present. Right? So that's dominance. And so the, by looking at the sort of pedigree of a, person, of a, a family, you can make um, assessment about whether a, a trait is in, inherited in a dominant way. And the features of a dominant trait are that the disease must occur at every generation in the family. So that means that in order for an individual down here, which is when you look at pedigrees, the bottom of the pedigree is the most recently born individuals. These three children are the products of these two parents. These individuals are the product of parents four and five here and so forth. And uh, when, you, when you look at a dominant trait, the only way people down in this part of the pedigree can get the trait is if one of the parents had the trait. There's no other way because if neither of these parents had the trait, they, then uh, since it's dominant, it means that they didn't inherit the dominant mutation. So in a dominant pedigree then, a characteristic is every generation has the disease um, and um, and it's uh, uh, and that happens without fail. Okay, so uh, among the other things you could do with uh, simple genetic uh, observation of families or or breeding of plants or breeding of animals 
is that you can make predictions about what the probability of, in, of your inheriting a particular trait will be based on uh, simple statistical uh, tests, right? And so, um, so it, uh, if you have a, a dominant trait that's the result of a heterozygous trait, the likelihood that the trait will be passed on is 50-50 because if this, say, individual one has a, the Huntington's disease allele and a normal allele, uh, individuals in their, in their uh, children have a 50% chance of getting the nominant one and a 50% chance of getting the normal, the normal gene for Huntington's. And so, uh, so at each generation then, there's a 50% chance that the individuals will or will not have the disease. And just sort of anecdotally, um, with Huntington's disease is a very, uh, is a highly uh, penetrant and lethal disease that affects individuals uh, after their, the age of reproduction. So often uh, individuals don't even know whether they're gonna have Huntington's disease until they're 50 or 60 years old. And so uh, that means that they have children before they know whether they have Huntington's disease or not. But uh, if they know that one of their parents had Huntington's disease, so say you were this, this, this guy over here, uh, this guy would have a 50% chance of having Huntington's disease because one of his parents had Huntington's disease. So using that information, you could predict what his likelihood of having it is as 50%. Okay, so as a, a, a sort of a statistical uh, sort of uh, um, exercise, uh, this individual called 14 here is the result of mating between this person and this person, right? And each of these people have Huntington's disease. And the, the fact that there's two lines here means that it's a so-called consanguineous relationship, which means that these two people are cousins of each other. And so they, they mated with each other, even though uh, they're cousins. Uh, and, uh, and they mated with each other uh, knowing that there's Huntington's disease in their, in their entire family. So the question is, is can you predict what the uh, probability is that individual number 14 will have Huntington's disease, knowing that in each generation there's a 50-50 chance. So um, um, this, this guy has a 50% chance and this guy has a 50% chance of passing it on. So take, take a minute and think about it. And then uh, we'll see, um, see if you, if you could come up with uh, uh, what, what you think the probability is. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of minutes. I'll be right back. So I have to just go print something off in the lab. I'll be back in exactly two seconds.
so, uh, but so is, is there a consensus then? Anybody want to say what they think the probability is? Seventy-five percent. That that's correct. Do you want to, do you want to explain to your classmates how you came up with that number? I can't hear, but maybe you could explain it. That's correct. Uh, that's the correct thinking. Uh, you know, as a as just as a general rule, um, you can think about uh, this is a simple probability uh, question as well. And so, and, as I said, each each individual has a 50% chance, a 0.5 chance of passing the the mutant gene on to the progeny, um, uh, of, of passing the uh, you know, one of its traits uh, onto the progeny. So you can also use a multiplication rule, and you could multiply 0.5 times 0.5, and that's 0.25 chance that they'll have the sort of uh, the wild type gene, basically. That's uh, and that means that the, the remaining chances uh, will, will have the mutant gene. So you could do it just by using simple math, where you multiply the the probability of getting uh, uh, the, the genes as well. So rather than do it, what you did was kind of thought through like a Punnett square in your head uh, to sort of reason uh, what the probability was. But you can also do it just by using pure statistical sort of uh, uh, manipulation of the, the probabilities of passing along each gene. And so when you <clears throat> when people do population studies and population genetics, that that's uh, very uh, that that using that kind of math where you use uh, probabilities of passing on a trait uh, to the progeny uh, uh, is more, it's, it's more powerful to use the mathematical approach than the, the, the rational approach because sometimes uh, you have to deal with traits where the probability of passing on the gene is not a simple 50-50 uh, chance like this, but it might be a 0.5% chance or something like that where, they, where the probability of passing on is affected by other genes. And so it's often, uh, it's, it's often useful to use a more mathematical kind of way to, uh, to ascertain the, the probability. Nevertheless, you, you were absolutely right. And, um, and so uh, the take home message is also, of course, uh, number one is uh, it's not a good idea to produce children with first cousins uh, because the probability of passing on negative traits is very high. Um, and, uh, and that in a trait like this, Huntington's disease in particular, uh, because the gene inheriting the mutant allele always produces the, the disease, uh, you, you, uh, it's very important to know in advance what, what you're dealing with before, before having children. Okay. So, uh, so I've been talking now for you know, too long, for more than an hour. Uh, do, do we want to take a five-minute break? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure what the timing and so forth is for the for the day, but uh, we could take a short break and then I could continue on the other side of the break, um, uh, or you tell me what you'd like to do. Yeah. So let's just you know, resume in five minutes. Good. Yeah, five minutes would be good for me. Okay. Okay. So we'll convene in five minutes.
if you have any questions, mm -hmm. so we can ask him before we, you know, leave. Okay. Any questions on genetics, polymorphism, in the nuclear type, gene mapping, and so on. Thank you.